in one sutta, uh, the Buddha explained that if uh, if one breaks the the precepts, then then uh, they'll go to the lower land, right? like the hell. Uh, but uh, how how do we know for for sure, uh, sister? Because uh, like uh, maybe like uh, when someone steals something, but maybe very small things, or or, or when uh, someone uh, uh, maybe just do a, a wrong speech, wrong speech like that. So how? How could uh, someone uh, speak wrongly and then uh, go to the raw realm? realm? How, how do we know about it, uh, sister? The precepts are an operative game while you're living, okay? Hmm. You break, uh, you know, there's lots of things that go on that we think we need to clean ourselves up as much as possible. The, the uh, progress on the main path of really getting to the total end result, like arahat and fruition, is on a path where um, there just isn't anything going on anymore with breaking precepts at all. When we teach you, when I teach you, here's what happens. In, in uh, the Sunday school in the beginning, what should be happening is that precepts and hindrances are taught side by side. Now, let me say this about um, heaven and hell for just a minute. Last night I was teaching some people, about 30 people, who had been Buddhists for a long time, but they never knew what the Buddha did at all. They didn't know anything about it. They only know they've been declared Buddhists and they really want to know what it is the Buddha did, uh, but um, they don't have any knowledge of why they're Buddhists or what it means at all. So one of the things I, I pointed to in the situation was one of the things that's neat about being a Buddhist is that we don't think so much about heaven and hell while we're living this life like some people would in other faiths. When I was a Christian, I had to die to get to heaven. When I became a Buddhist, it became very, very clear that every day of your life, you can get up and make that day either heaven or hell. So when you say hell and hell realms, this is very, very, you know, variation. What's, the, what's so important about stealing a pencil or stealing a few pieces of paper at work and bringing them home for your copy machine? Just maybe 10 pages. Well, there's 300 people that work there. That's 3,000 pages. <laughs> you know, one ream of paper a day goes out of that office and they have 10 offices. That's about five boxes. You know? So, you know, this all adds up. We're contributing to it. But if you do something that is a small theft or a small mistake, it's personally up to you. God is not watching you, going to punish you, going to strike you dead if you do something. Okay. It's not the same as what we worried about constantly in Christianity. He's going to come and get you, you know. And the thing is that you, your instructions in Buddhism are if you break a precept, you immediately take your precept again. I don't care if you want to go to the men's room and sit there and just do it there, or you want to just bow your head and take it yourself or sit there for a moment and write it out on a notepad, the five precepts, but you take them again, right then. You are teaching yourself not to break them. Why are they so important? That, that's it, right? Why are they so important is because hell is right around the corner in the form of the hindrances is the first level of hell. This umbrella. Okay, this umbrella is going to have one, two, three, four, five points on it. And this umbrella is constructed of the five precepts. No kill, no steal, no wrong sexuality, no 
Mm -hmm. No. Um, what's the next one? <laughs> Somebody tell me. <laughs> See, false. no. What is it? False speech. Um, oh yeah, no, no. Um, no lies. Gossip. There you go. Slander. And the last one. What's that one? No. Uh, no, no uh, intoxicants, alcohol, um, drugs. No drugs or alcohol. Now, the importance of this umbrella is that when this person When this person is underneath this umbrella, and they're they're here, okay. You know, I've been playing with the doodle thing, right? <laughs> so this person is protecting themselves from this kind of acid rain. And the acid rain that's coming down is lust and greed, getting caught in lust and greed, hatred, aversion, restlessness, whoops, not well, I'm doing it, it's okay, restlessness, guilt, remorse, Sloth, torpor, and doubt. So here's, here's what you have to say to yourself. You run your own life. Last night I was trying to explain to these young people, they have, when they're born, their parents also buy a ship for them. And when they own this ship, the only person that's going to handle the ship the only person that's going to have anything to do with that ship is them. They're the only ones that get to steer it. Only you get to steer that ship. Nobody else is going to take care of it. Just remember that. So when you're going through life, you formulate how easy or how difficult it's going to be for you to pass through life. This is what's happening. You break these precepts. You kill. You, uh, you, uh, steal, you um, have wrongful sex, or you lie and cheat and, and that sort of thing, or contribute to gossip or slander somebody, or you start to get into drugs and alcohol, what's going to happen to you is the payback. So now, what this person is showing you is an umbrella, and these are the, these are the precepts, okay? So we say, you know, here are the precepts. umbrella. And here are the hindrances attacking that person. So the Buddha showed you this. He didn't tell you you have to do it. Nobody ordered you to do this. No monk should have ever ordered you to do it in Sunday school. Even your parents, they can sort of yeah, I'll try to rear you and help and very get strict with you about this. But the fact is, you're going to go through the rest of your life and you better learn how this works. Because right here under the umbrella, okay, underneath this umbrella, underneath here is the foundations for heaven 
And each day that you live, you form a heaven or you surrender by doing something by out you cheat you take you do break one of the precepts and you produce karma that's the karma you produce and when you produce the karma the action of killing stealing or doing one of the wrong things breaking the precepts you're opening the door for these guys to get through the umbrella each time you do something you're causing a hole in the umbrella see that and if you cause those holes and you do not patch them up and patching them up means that you need to take your precepts again take your precepts again and patch them up you see you're living a life where you get to patch these holes up yeah if you don't patch them up by taking the precepts again and asking the precepts to help you and try again and 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 again beep beep and you keep doing it until your brain says oh you want to live this way so you can have an experience of um you can have an experience of, oops, we didn't get the right one. Where's the right one? I don't remember where it is. Let's try that one. What does that one do? Oh, well, anyway, this is heaven. <laughs> Pink is heaven. Pink is heaven. Pink is wonderful vibrations, loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness. This is what's under the umbrella with you. Okay, and if you break the precepts, these guys up here, they can get in there and they can, um, can attack you. Oops, I don't understand what I'm doing here. Uh -uh. I need to play more with this. <laughs> I don't have time to play with this. Here. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. Anyway, these these droplets, these droplets are um, are the these irritants. These are irritants that come to your life. So what are they? They're Kamapala. See? Now these might not come right away. So that's why you doubt what I'm saying right now. Because you might steal something yesterday and you don't feel any different today. But here's these these attack you in a couple different ways but one of the main ways they happen is you know if you take whatever you ever hear the expression what goes around comes around do you ever hear that expression Fendi did you ever hear that expression what goes around comes around yes. what you put out you get back do you ever hear that sort in most languages they have an expression like this this is what we're talking about here Whatever you do to another person, that is how they will do it back onto you. So the Christians have it. Everybody has it. The Muslims have it. Everybody has this in there. The Jews have it too. The Jews have a unique way out of it. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> once, once a year, there's this big prayer thing that the men can go to, and it forgives them for everything for that year in one big bang, right? Like that. And then they start with a fresh slate. I was shocked when I heard about that. <laughs> I'm not sure I even believe it, but but um, they do have the moral setup for good living, and it's how you you uh, deal with this. And the whole system that we have here is similar in get in, in you understanding that um, you pre create. This is what I was telling you. You're talking to me about when you die. Where am I going to go? Okay. I'm talking to you about what's happening, what's happening right here, right now, today, see? And so when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you like this. Here is a blank page, white paper. Everybody here should take a blank piece of white paper and you put it up on the wall where you're going to see it every morning or when you're in the bedroom or put it up on a ceiling if you want so you look at it before you go to bed every night, okay? And this blank picture, this, this is a blank page, 
is is one day. That's what it is. And in your mind, every day, you are going to paint this picture. You are the artist. You have a choice. You can use any of these colors. You can use, um, you know, dark blacks and browns and stuff like that. If it was a bad, sad day, whites and browns and blacks like that, you can use sky blues and sea blues and all beautiful greens and colors for flowers and all that, purples and everything. That was a happy day. That was really a lot of smiling and everything. If you have an overly pink day, that means there was a lot of joy there that day. And you can, you can make your own painting. I'm trying to get the kids that I'm working with now to start making their own picture of each day to see what happens. How do they paint their day? And then when it's finished, you leave it alone, you put it in the past, you decide what you're going to do tomorrow. These pictures, they don't keep going. You see, you make that every day. So the question is, do we need to overwork the idea? The Chinese have a way of overworking the idea of life and death. And let's get really heavily involved in merit to protect ourselves. And yes, merit will help if you did something wrong and you do merit to help yourself, um, you know, cancel out the bad action that you did. That's one way of balancing the scales. These scales, though, are absolutely real. For example, I don't know how old are you are. How old you are. Offendi, how old are you? Uh, 44. Okay, well, of course, in your life, I say anybody over 25, I've never met anybody over 25 who could say they didn't have anything that they did wrong before that. They have nothing to worry about. And uh, I never met anybody over 25 who could say to me they never had anything they did when they were younger that didn't, that they, it never came around and hit them later on. See, you might be cruel to somebody in the third grade and when you're 21, meet them in a store and they might trip you on the way out because <laughs> you did something really mean to them in third grade. <laughs> I, I was coaching a man one time, he was doing forgiveness and he, he wrote me a letter, he says, the darnest thing happened to me. I went to the store and I actually met this woman and they were still living in the same area and he had gone away and become a doctor and big important person and everything. They weren't in the same social status, you know, group. But he remembered this girl. And when he went up to her, to, she said hi. She remembered him. And, and, and the thing was, when he saw her, he just went uh, like that because he remembered what he did to her in third grade. This is a funny story. And he had stopped doing forgiveness. But he, when he was driving back from the store to his house, he started doing forgiveness that night for what he had done to her in third grade. He had humiliated her. He would sit behind her and pull her pigtails until she's twisting like this and saying, stop it, stop it. And the teacher would say, what is that? What are you talking about? Why are you disturbing my class? And he would go, I am not disturbing your class. She is. <laughs> and she used to get in trouble all the time in third grade. Okay, Effendi. And he's like in his 60s now. And he remember they meet each other and remember, and he felt guilty and restless about that. He went back to forgiveness and kept forgiving her until it was wiped clean. And then he saw her again in the store and he just felt fine. So he cleaned something out. So this was stuck inside of him all those years. And he was a kind man. He was, he was a, a, a obstetrical surgeon for women. He was a kind person, but he had this thing inside him, this knot, you see? So the, what we're talking about is he was carrying around a part of hell in his life. That's what we're talking about. So when you say to me, hell, and we talk about all these realms, the place that, where, where are you living now? Where are you living? Are you? In Indonesia. 
Indonesia, okay. In Malaysia, they have a place called Chin Sui, and we go up there in the mountains to have this retreat. And it's a huge Chinese temple, huge place. And they have the six, nine stations of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and they made it like an amusement park and you're supposed to walk through this thing and I'm telling you it's just like Disneyland but it's not pleasant at all the nine stages of hell and <laughs> I have pictures of them someplace I sent them to David because David was very much fixating very very much studying and concentrating the hells and the heavens and the levels and everything and I'm there come back come back come back to earth you know because he was all wrapped up in this. So do you understand what I drew here is I'm showing you that these precepts are a protection against these hindrances. These hindrances are the fruits of your actions, the fruits of them. So when you when you decide when you do something, what is it that happens when you do something? What is the karma? How does it work? First, you have an intention. That one measures the weight of it. And then what happens is, um, this is like the cheetah part, cheetah, right? Okay, I gotta do this the right way. Whoops, okay. I, I lost my, is that right? Oops, I, I lost my, there's a, there's a button on this thing I have to learn about. <laughs> I keep touching the button, there we go. Okay, the first one is intention. And that one is the Chaitana. Okay. The second one is the, um, the action. And that one is the comma. That is the comma. That is actually it is the action. Okay. The third one is the um, uh, Vipaka. Vipaka now has been uh, has taken over the last definition has been removed and they say we pocket is the result of comma we pocket is not the result of comma this is the ripening the ripening of the action that's in the old old dictionaries we look back and we can find we pocket was the ripening so here was the intention to grow an apple right so this was the chaitana so here's the seed of the apple, okay? And the comma was to plant the seed and then uh, plant the seed in the ground and start to grow the tree, see, like that. And then Vipaka is when the flowers come out and they start to ripen and they turn into the apple. And then the Kamapala, Comma, the comma, you take comma again, and you say fruit, comma, pala. That is the fruit of the action. So actually, that, that is the apple. That one is the apple here. That's the apple. Forget about this one. This is just another flower. <laughs> there you go. That's another flower. But these flowers, they turn into apples, okay? So here you are, you have an intention. You're gonna do something, cheat, steal a pen, steal some paper, whatever it is you're gonna do, or have a big party binge or something, I don't know. Then you actually do it here, and then you go home, if it was a party binge, and you throw up all night. <laughs> You feel really rotten and you go to bed, but you have trouble sleeping and you got a headache. And here's where you're throwing up and you're getting really sick. That's, that's the payback. So what I'm telling you is when you're 25 and up, I don't know anybody that had something back here. They did something to somebody, something in third grade, something. And then it's going to come around and kick you. And that's what I call a karmic... This is my own name, karmic kickback. <laughs> and that's where whatever you did, it comes back and it bites you. And, and why did it happen? Because you broke the precepts. You collapsed your umbrella. You caused a, a hole in the umbrella. And then those things came in that were the hindrances 
where you had sloth and torpor, you couldn't sleep, you've had restlessness, guilt, and remorse. When you took whatever it was, it was lust and, and greed. And then you can even turn the hatred and aversion on yourself. And then you had doubt about the whole thing. Maybe I shouldn't do that again. Maybe I should stay under the umbrella. You see? So the Buddha thought about all this. He experienced all this. He has all those Jataka tales. Oh my gosh. You know, he has all these stories. And these are the, the stories that, that tell you about all the things that were happening to him all that time and he had all these experiences and he he tested everything and so by the time he gets here when the buddha's here he has all this information for us he try when he starts to teach he's he's backed up by a hundred thousand lifetimes of going through what you're going through right now in every aspect you can and how much loving kindness should we have how much forgiveness should we have when he was born as a baby and his father was jealous of the baby and only wanted the wife who was very beautiful to pay attention to him. He decides to kill the child. What does he do? He cuts off the baby's hands. And the, the Buddha remembers, the Bodhisattva, he, he doesn't get angry at his father. He doesn't, he doesn't hate his father. He keeps his mind pure. He cuts his feet off. He still... He's still there in his mother's arms. She's going crazy. But the, but the Bodhisattva just looks at his father's eyes and is sending him loving kindness and forgiveness because he's his father. He doesn't understand. And then he cuts his head off and he's dead. That's how he had a tough time. <laughs> I mean, he had a tough time. This is the extreme of that story. But these stories are kept for us to try to look at those and to remember to remember what? To remember that he gave us a whole system. Not just a piece of it, but a whole system. That's what's remarkable about Buddhism. You see? When everybody died in my family, I don't know if you read the little book that I wrote or not, you know, online. But if you read it, when those people died in the family, I was just devastated so badly. And I couldn't get over one person before the next one died, before the next one died, before the next one killed over, before the last one died, for the, then my mother died. So first, you know, the bang, 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 bang. I felt in those days like God is testing me. We would say God is testing you. He's trying to see if you can carry the burden. My grandmother would say, you know that God didn't give you anything that was too hard for you to carry. Because as a human being, he will carry you if he needs to. He will never give you something you can't get through. It's all a test. She would tell us this when I was little. So I kept waiting for him to just slide down from the sky and put a flagstone in front of me so I could keep walking because I was so devastated. I was wiped out crying. I was dehydrated. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. You know, there were no, go to the priest, you go to the ministers. Yes, I know it's death we come from dust we go to dust dust to dust thank you that's what you're going to say you're not going to tell me how anything works <laughs> and i find buddhism when i'm 50 years old and i'm there whoa wait a second how come nobody's talking about this thing and how can anybody say to you that buddhism is pessimistic that's my favorite one how can anybody say to you that buddhism is pessimistic you can't be kidding me. It has all these answers for you. I just explained to you why you shouldn't be stealing. What's going to happen to you? Or why you shouldn't break the precepts. And how you're protected by the precepts to protect you from the hindrances. What I just told you about was heaven or hell. In this lifetime. Learning about where you're going to go next time is based on what you do this time. So come back to earth and get ready for tomorrow, <laughs> okay, that's the reality here, and put your paper up, and start painting your days, and see how you're doing with your perception, or your perspective of how you see life, do you see it as pink, and oranges, and purples, and chartreuse, and these wonderful, great, vibrant, psychedelic colors, or do you see it as darkness and heaviness and overwhelming gloom and blackness and everything because you were just went through a bad time? You remember you have a friend in 
a Nietzsche if that happens because everything is changing and whatever was isn't now and doesn't have to be again if we remember it that this too shall pass and then what do you have when this too shall pass leave it behind in a box and put up a new paper and start again and paint a new day okay that's what you look at it so i expect to see pinks oranges and uh i think you should go look up the artist matus m-a-t-e-u-s i think it is matus Matus was a French artist and look at the colors, the vibrancy, the colors. It's extraordinary. I went to see another, another, um, another impressionist artist in the gallery about a month later and it was a local artist and he did paintings that were six feet by 10 feet high. And everything in the whole gallery when they hung the gallery for the exhibit was brown and darker brown and gray brown and black and brown and light brown and the, the different positions on the canvas but all of it was dark 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 so you went in the gallery and you walked around this wall and that wall and through that room and the other room and the other room and through that one and then you had to walk out of the gallery and the man the actually the group I don't know who did this, but it was wonderful. You felt so much oppression looking at this collection of art. You felt so depressed by the time you got through looking at 30 paintings that were black and brown and gray and this way. And you went out the door, Matus, the parrot drawing of Matus. There was a parrot. He painted a parrot in a window with a jungle behind it. Matus was like this facing you and you went oh, like that when you went out of the room you looked at Matus and you went oh thank you thank you <laughs> whoever hung that room and I they said how did you like the exhibit I said to them it was fantastic the people who hung that exhibit did the best job and I walked out of the gallery <laughs> I didn't like the exhibit. I thought it was terrible. But the last thing I saw in my mind, you see what's in your mind. Mind is the forerunner of everything. And my next morning had no idea that exhibit even existed. My mind was on Matus. You see? So what you see not what you think and ponder, that's nice, what you see and ponder, what you hear and ponder, what you smell and ponder, what you say and ponder, that determines your whole disposition and whether you're going to get depressed or you're going to be happy, it's up to you. Because you know why? You know why? Because it's your ship. It's your ship. You are steering it. It's your choice. See? And uh, I don't know if the artist of that exhibit probably figured out what was going on. I hope he didn't go and take the Matus away because it would be very sad. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And it, it was a beautiful gesture for somebody to put that there. I think they thought people would not come to the gallery. They would pass around the word and no one would come. But then when I went to a tea house after I went to that gallery, it's a long time ago this happened. I went to the tea house to get some coffee, you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm listening to people say, did you see the Matus? <laughs> Nobody was saying, did you see the gray and brown and black and the black and brown and gray? And <laughs> they weren't saying that. They were saying, did you see the Matus?